Environment Initiative and the Center for Latino, Latina, and Latin American Studies. The annual Johnston Lecture was very dear to Lori Johnston, an SOJC Hall of Achievement member and award-winning New York Times writer who established the series in memory of her husband, Richard Johnston, another SOJC Hall of Achievement member and founding executive editor of Sports Illustrated. The series is made possible by generous gifts from the Johnston family, Georgie Jones of US News and World Report, and the Correspondence Fund. A focus of the annual lecture is to bring professionals to the SOJC for thought-provoking lectures, workshops, and discussions about the thorny issues today's journalists and communicators face. Through lectures like this, the work of the Center for Science Communication Research and our co-sponsors, the University of Oregon is helping to tackle the pressing societal challenges posed by climate change. In this moment of unprecedented and dramatic environmental change, the UO has made it a priority to generate new approaches, collaborations, information, and innovations to meet these challenges head on through research, teaching, and practice. Our work at the university crosses disciplines, schools, colleges, and generations with a goal of creating urgent and lasting change to improve our world and the world our students and those who follow will be inheriting. It is through the lens of this urgent need that I am so pleased to welcome to the university tonight Dr. Renee Salas, a well-recognized expert on climate change and its implications for health and healthcare delivery. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you, to introduce Dr. Salas, Dr. Ellen Peters, Philip H. Knight Chair and Professor in the School of Journalism and Communication, as well as in the Department of Psychology in our College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Peters is also the director of SOJC's Center for Science, Communication, and Research. Please help me welcome Dr. Ellen Peters. There we go. I think maybe now. You know, once we learned to use Zoom, we figured out Zoom, and now we totally forgot how to use everything else. Um, thank you, Dr. Woodruff Borden. I appreciate your um, appreciate uh, all the things you said, and also thank you to the co-sponsors uh, who made tonight possible. Big problems like climate change demand widespread action, and science can point us towards solutions. But it takes engaging people through effective communication to fully implement those solutions. In our quest to make complex science useful to improve people's lives, the Center for Science Communication Research focuses on how to communicate about climate change so we can promote effective action instead of confusion. Climate change is already affecting people's health and quality of life around the world, but its effects are unevenly distributed with a disproportionate impact on the populations that are already the most vulnerable. That's why tonight's lecture is a joint effort with the Knight Campus, which shares our goal of improving the quality of life for people around the world, with the UO Environment Initiative, which shares our commitment to equity and to social justice, and to the, with the Center for Latino, Latina, and Latin American Studies, which shares our deep concern for human and environmental crises in the Americas. How we talk about climate change and its health effects can make a difference to how people respond. No one understands this better than healthcare professionals who deliver complex medical information to patients every single day. And as our, and as our most trusted messengers, no one is better positioned to educate the public about these critical health issues. Dr. Renee Salas is leading the charge in researching and communicating how climate change impacts our health and our healthcare systems. I recently had the privilege of partnering with Dr. Salas to identify evidence-based strategies for communicating the impacts of climate change on health. We published our perspective in the New England Journal of Medicine, 
with the hope of helping healthcare professionals convey the harms of climate change to patients and others in ways that are real and in ways that are relevant, um, and in particular, in ways that incite action. An emergency room physician in the Center for Social Justice and Health Equity at Massachusetts General Hospital, and as co-director of the Climate MD program at Harvard, Harvard University's Center for Climate, Health, and Global Environment, Dr. Salas works at the intersection of healthcare, equity, and climate change. This work has earned her one of the highest honors in the medical field, election to the National Academy of Medicine in 2021. In addition to founding and leading the working group of over 80 US organizations for the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change, Dr. Salas spearheads the Climate Crisis in Clinical Practice Initiative in partnership with the New England Journal of Medicine Group. She has also served as a guest editor for the journal series on fossil fuel pollution and climate change. Dr. Salas is one of the healthcare field's most committed and vocal proponents of immediate climate action. She's testified before Congress for the Full House Committee uh, on Oversight and Reform, and she regularly lends her expertise to different main, uh, mainstream media outlets, like the Associated Press, NPR, New York Times, and USA Today. Climate change threatens everything that we care about. Its impacts are already here, threatening our healthcare, threatening our healthcare systems, and contributing to death and disease, especially among our most vulnerable populations. Dr. Salas joins us tonight to discuss what we can all do about that. Uh, an equitable transition away from fossil fuel remains our best bet for improving health and for improving environmental equity, both now as well as into the future. But how can we achieve this transition when the science is telling us we have so little time left? According to Dr. Salas, the answer lies in communication and storytelling. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Renee Salas. Well, thank you so much. Are we good, Mike Wise? Yes? Yeah. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. It is an honor and privilege to be here with all of you. And I look forward to our discussion. I think, as always, how I approach these, but I think especially this visit and this conversation is I'm probably most looking forward to the Q&A because I look forward to that bi-directional knowledge exchange and learning from all of you about how to operationalize some of the things I talk about. So I view this as a thought experiment in many ways. I'm going to create a menu option of ways that you can engage. And I challenge you right now, whether you're sitting at home or whether you're sitting in the stands, to commit to at least one action when you walk out of here. Don't worry. I'll give you some options. And I'm sure we'll come up with more as we have our Q&A. But I think the time for action is now. And we all have a role to play. And I want you to harness that power that you have, whether you're a student or a faculty member or the dean or you name it. And so I look forward to the discussion. So because we uh, had a little technical glitch, I will not be able to do the fancy tech poll. But so I'm going to do old fashioned. I want you to shout it out. When you think about climate change, what word comes to mind? And for those that, who are watching live stream, I'll repeat what I hear. High temperatures. Global warming. Glaciers melting. Stronger hurricanes. Wildfire. Extinction. Severe weather. Inequity. Unpredictable change. Migration. Say it again. Sea level rising. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Political discourse. Anxiety. Anxiety. I'll take two more. Extremes. Extremes. Pollution. Pollution. Great. Well, thank you. So that provides. You can kind of create the, old, the word map in your mind. I didn't hear the word 
polar bears. I realized since I had clicked forward, that probably may have planted it. But for the most part, and I, this is true for me, when you think about climate change, you thought about polar bears and icebergs. And while I love polar bears, and I love nature and icebergs, it does not necessarily motivate action, make it feel personal. And so the reality is that from all the words and things that came to your mind for those who didn't say it out loud, what I hope after this talk is that we can begin when we think about climate change, we start to think about people. And I think some of the things that you guys mentioned, I'm sure were driven by experiences that you have had. But I argue from a health standpoint, and as an emergency medicine physician, the reason to act on climate change is because it is essential to improve our health and address health disparities. We cannot achieve health equity in this country, let alone the globe, without action on climate change. So as we, let's see if I can get this, there we go. I also want to think about this question. This you can keep to yourself. I won't ask you to say it out loud. But when you think about what a net zero US economy and a climate resilient society looks like, what do you envision? We have to have a vision of what we are working towards. What are these solutions going to achieve? And I imagine that it's a little different and if we were to get everyone's image and vision together in one place. And that's how it should be, because we're all coming at it from a different perspective. And so we think about hope for the future. And I am hopeful. Don't, I don't want anyone to walk out of here thinking that this is not something we can tackle. Because I see it not only, it is a challenge, but it's an enormous opportunity, especially to address interconnected challenges. So we're going to tackle three things today. One. I hope I can convince you that climate action is a prescription to improve health and equity. Two, maybe, I think I need to get better positioned here. Two, that health can make climate change personal and motivate people to action. Hence, a lot of the things that you guys are all doing in this room. And three, that we all have a role to play. And again, I'm holding you to that commitment to walk out of here with something, one thing, however small, that you're going to do. So let's talk about climate action as a prescription to improve health and equity. I'm going to start with a patient case. So I was working in the emergency department on an overnight shift, Massachusetts General Hospital, when a young girl presented struggling to breathe. It was her third visit that week for an asthma attack. As we connected her up to the monitors and gave her the breathing treatments to open her airways, gave her the steroids to decrease that inflammation, her mom began recounting the events that had happened since her last emergency department visit. And finally, she just stopped and looked at me and said, I have done everything that the doctors have asked me to do, and she just keeps getting worse. What am I missing? Well, those words continued to ring in my ears. So long after they went upstairs, I was looking back through her chart. And all of her clinicians had been following the latest evidence-based guidelines. They were doing everything right according to medical practice. But yet she had continued to get worse. So I asked myself, what were we missing? I then looked up her address. She lived in close proximity to a highway. No surprise, it is not an accident where highways are placed. And so she had been breathing exhaust from cars and trucks and other vehicles over the course of her young life. And it has been shown that when children are exposed long term to air pollution, especially that from traffic, that it causes asthma. Now, just to put this in perspective, causality in medicine is the holy grail. It takes immense scientific evidence for us to be able to say that environmental exposure causes
causes a disease in an individual patient. Now, of course, we can never say with absolute certainty, but there is no clinician that would hesitate to link smoking for 50 years to a patient's lung cancer. And I argue we can think about these things in the same way. And so we had been giving her treatments that stabilized her disease, but then we sent her back out into that very same environment that was impossible for her to manage her disease because that air pollution continued to create hazards in addition to other exposures that was, her mother was right. They were doing everything, but it was an impossible situation. So I began to realize that in the emergency department, I often feel like I'm pulling patients, drowning in a river one at a time, only to see so many more behind. And so it's only when we walk upstream to find out why are patients falling in the river in the first place that we can get to the root cause. So that's what I do. I run along a river upstream trying to work at the root cause, which is fossil fuels. The, the burning of fossil fuels is driving air pollution that, as I said, not only causes asthma in children, but also for others out there, it's actually also known to cause heart disease. So heart illness and been linked with death. Now, when we hear, talk about heart health, I hear about exercise, good diet, cholesterol medication. We don't talk about clean air. But we need to start making these connections. Because the reality is that air pollution also is linked and associated with other diseases, whether that's type 2 diabetes or cognitive deficiencies, poor birth outcomes. Now, all of this can be a downer. But then we think about the opportunity that we can achieve when we get to the root cause, get all the way upstream, and can prevent these diseases. Interlinked, interconnected challenges. Again, policy has been shown to direct where power plants are placed, where polluting industry is positioned in regards to a neighborhood, where a highway is placed. But that same policy can also be leveraged to achieve health benefits and good. But we have to acknowledge that these decisions are made because it has been shown that air pollution is disproportionately experienced by communities of color. And this is true whether you look across income, geography, time and again. So as I had these, this reckoning, I also had to acknowledge that my prescriptions had to be different. I couldn't just write for nebulizers, steroid treatments. Again, Band-Aids on a bullet wound. So instead, I needed to be thinking about how can I, or how can we, as a healthcare system, think about air filtration systems as a prescription? Can we educate patients and families to look at air quality apps in order to determine outdoor activity and exposure. You guys know that better than anyone, given your wildfire smoke exposure. What about home weatherization? Making sure that windows are sealed, that temperature control within a house, which will also help with energy bills. Again, interconnected solutions. But ultimately, the prescription that was needed is an equitable transition from fossil fuels. And I realized my toolbox as an emergency medicine physician cannot achieve this alone. Hence why I'm here. We collectively can achieve this. And if these avoidance of the health harms from air pollution, the fact that it will benefit most those communities that have suffered disproportionately the most and contributed the least. If that's not enough motivation, I'll provide more. Don't worry. So the burning of fossil fuels accounted for 
92% of man-made CO2 emissions in 2020. It is the primary driver of climate change. I want to spend a moment here. So this is, shows years. So I want you to find the year you were born. You can date yourself. There's obviously some reference points here. Born in 1950, born in 1980, born in 2020. I was born in, born in um, 1981. So as you see, for most of my life, I had a relatively, I had a stable climate. As with all of these climate-related diagrams, red, dark red, <laughs> usually means bad, either extremes of temperatures, heat, et cetera. So you can see, for those of you younger in the room, you can see how there's a lot more red happening. But we also see what all of us in the room, I'm imagining we all are looking to have a healthy, long life, what we are going to be experiencing. And we're currently at about 1.1, 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. There is an urgency here. I'll get to that. I also want to note that the experiences that we are having, and you guys can speak to, talking about communication and storytelling, at 1.2 degrees Celsius is vital as we try to personalize this for what it means for our health. Because there is a 50-50 chance, according to the World Meteorologic Organization, that we could hit 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next five years. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to recognize from an emergency medicine standpoint, we are not prepared for what's happening now. And so there's an urgency to get prepared for what's happening. And we can hit 1.5, and then we can dip below and maintain it under. But we have to recognize that we are all alive at a moment where what we do now is arguably more important than at any other point in history. So what does that mean for health? Obviously, heat is a huge impact. I'll dive more into some of these specifics when I talk about opportunities for storytelling. But we know that heat has broad impacts, whether that's heat stroke, which is a life-threatening form, or worsening existing de disease for those who have heart, underlying heart or lung problems. We also think about higher pollen levels, wildfire smoke as far as other air quality, ground level ozone, which is driven by heat, not the ozone up up in the upper atmosphere when we think about ozone layer, but actually ozone that is catalyzed as we think about the um, heat uh, generated chemical reactions that can worsen underlying lung disease. We also think about food impacts. So crops are less nutritious, which is especially important for areas of the world where already on the nutritional or margin, nutritional margins. Think about water quality and quantity. We've seen that as far as different areas of water not being available. Thinking about different diseases like Vibrio, which is actually a bacteria that grows in warmer salt water. And that can cause a host of diseases, uh, including skin infections or sometimes what we call gastrointestinal illness, so vomiting, diarrhea. Talk about extremes of, or intensifying extreme weather, mental health impacts the longer-term disruption to healthcare systems and management of disease. We also think about vector-borne diseases. So ticks and mosquitoes can live in different areas of the country and for longer parts of the season, increasing risks in addition with other factors of us being exposed to them and contracting diseases like Lyme or West Nile. We also think about social issues like displacement and climate migration. All of that has a host of impacts around different organ systems, creating new diseases, worsening existing. There we go. It also is making it harder to deliver high quality health care. So as a doctor, I need a building, I need certain supplies, and I need power. Climate change actually threatens all of that. <laughs> I'll talk a few more of those stories. 
but it connects to the fundamental mission we have in the healthcare system to deliver high quality hair, care that is accessible to everyone. There's also another concept that I think is important to talk about, and that's climate change as a threat multiplier, meaning that it underlies other problems and makes those existing problems worse. This is the concept of how climate change can touch everything that we care about. So what does that mean? As I said, we have a sense of urgency. So this is the latest synthesis report from the IPCC, which is the world's leading climate scientists across the world who come together. And you'll see that in order to limit warming to 2 degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius, that we have to aggressively reduce our greenhouse gas emissions through an equitable transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And we need to have emissions by 2030, seven years from now, and get to net zero, by best estimates, by 2050. But from a health standpoint, if we think about the near-term benefits of reducing air pollution and minimizing this risk, then every fraction of a degree translates, that we can avoid, translates to better health, advancing health equity. So any goal that is outlined, I say from a health standpoint, we gotta go faster and farther. And when I have a patient crashing in front of me in the emergency department, I do everything that is possible to improve that patient's health. And we have to do the same thing here, a multi-pronged approach. Hence, again, why all of you are needed in order for us to achieve this. It's an enormous opportunity. Because, so again, I often had thought about, there are probably experts in the room who can help lend more uh, expertise around this. But trying to have large scale societal change can seem overwhelming. But there was actually this study that showed that you only have to engage 25% in order to achieve and change social convention and to achieve some aspects of large scale change. You don't have to engage everyone. In a perfect world, yes. From a health standpoint, yes. We want to protect everyone's health. We want to address everyone. But we have to be strategic in thinking about what are the best ways that we can leverage our resources in this urgent time to achieve the mission of an equitable transition from fossil fuels. So here's the takeaway message. And now we're going to start, I'm going to start hopefully planting some seeds that way you guys can start thinking, because again, we collectively have the answers. I don't individually have all the answers, but we collectively do. So I want to think about how we can make climate change personal and motivate people to action. We don't want them to just understand something. We want people to act and act towards the right things. Because reality is that to achieve that, individual actions will not get us to where we have to go. We have to have system change which can come from the top down, but also can come grassroots from the bottom up. And we need both approaches. So what do Americans think about climate change? So most Americans think climate change is happening. You'll see green line here is they think it's happening. The black line here is not happening. And the, as you see, it's been sort of a meandering baseline here over since 2009. Here is the breakdown in regards to who's alarmed. The sort of left side of the screen here are those who are most engaged, alarmed, versus dismissive. And there's been a steady trend towards the right hand over time. But what about people here in Douglas County? So global warming is happening, 64%. And then there's sort of some breakdown here in regards to what people think are the drivers, which may or may not. Anyway, does this surprise anyone about what you expected? And then this is what many Americans think global warming will harm them, but more think others will be harmed. So just to walk the 
might be sort of hard to see on the screen. So you personally, that this climate change will harm you personally, is on the far left-hand side. Then it's your family, people in your community, people in the United States, people in developing countries, the world's poor, future generations, plants and animal species. So you personally, again, back to the polar bear iceberg, what do you think about when you think about climate change? We don't want polar bears icebergs. Plant and animal species, that's what people still think about. We want to reverse this. We want 70 to 52 to be you personally. Because then people are invested. They recognize why we actually want to act and what the benefits are. So here's data from Douglas County. 57% acknowledge that, that global warming will harm people in the US. These questions are a little different because this was done in 2021. And that is where they have the county level data. This is the Yale climate communication firm or group. And then the previous data was from their December of 20, 2022 report, which had some updated questions. But just to frame this, this is sort of great moderate amount. And then here, global warming is already harming people in the US. It's sort of now slash within 10 years. So again, take that in a little bit of context. But I would argue 39% that global warming will harm me personally. So again, still um, a lot of opportunity. And here's an understanding that people have been understanding, at least in the cohort that they studied, that climate change does impact their health. So the yellow is October of 2014. The green is April of 2020. So you'll see, obviously, all of those different indicators. And they just sort of summarize some of the key things I mentioned before in the broad um, impacts. There has been an increasing recognition. But I also, just to say from our standpoint within health as we talk about this, we're not always tailoring our message for action. And so if we actually want people to act, we need to think about that strategically of how are we talking about this? How are we meeting people? Are we meeting people where they are? And so just the recognition alone, this to me does not necessarily mean it's actually causing people to act or engage or talk about it. And that's where you all come in. So how can we make climate change personal? What are some of the stories we can tell? I'm going to get, share some of my experiences, some thoughts, as seeds to start a conversation. There was a elderly gentleman who was acting confused. His wife called 911. And the EMS crew, or ambulance crew that I know well, when they arrived at this couple's house, they had to climb up to the top floor of some lower income housing. And they said that when they opened the door to this couple's apartment, they felt like they were being hit with heat from the Sahara Desert. We had been experiencing record-breaking heat at, for the, at the time in the Boston area. And when they walked in to this couple's apartment, there was a window that was partially cracked, but they had no access to other cooling. As we took the patient and transferred him over to the stretcher, we got core temperature. I won't, you can guess how we get core temperature. But this man's temperature was 106 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is what we call heat stroke, that literally his organs and his brain were not working because body temperature was too high. I often don't think about his wife who was left in that apartment. You guys have unfortunately experienced significant heat which I'll talk about in a second. But before that, I want to share a little bit of data. I wanted, this is an educational institution. We're going to dive into some data here. But this figure is based off region. So that's the south and the west, top and bottom. This lists some different hospitalization reasons that are associated with heat. 
And then we look at the temperature based off of heat index, so both absolute temperature and humidity, which higher heat indexes mean greater danger for our own health. And you'll see that the checkered boxes here are when the peak hospitalizations occur. And the gray line is when heat alerts when go out. So public health departments often release heat alerts to warn people of high heat. You'll see in the south, there the heat alert goes out right before sort of the temperatures of when most people are hospitalized and hence when we think people are really being harmed in a community. But look at the west. People are actually hospitalized at 81 degrees Fahrenheit from a heat index standpoint. And you'll see that heat alerts go out well after that. Due to multiple reasons, but you think about infrastructure, people in the south have been historically hotter environments. They have heat pumps or air conditioning, other ways for cool. They, have, they know what to do when it's hot. They have behavior adaptation. Their bodies actually are better adjusted potentially, especially after long exposure in summer, to potentially be, to be uh, equipped for that kind of heat. So while this isn't surprising, it shows that we need data to drive what we do because we are, people had historically been missing the boat as far as when alerts were going out. So this heat wave that you guys all lived through, how many people were here when this happened? Yeah, so for most people in the room. This event was deemed by climate scientists to be virtually impossible without climate change. It's been estimated that there is at least 868 deaths across the Pacific Northwest, and arguably we are not great at always identifying deaths related to heat because, as you saw, I can, there can be different reasons that we don't pick up in our scientific measures. And he, again, my colleagues here, and I have some that live in this area, as you might imagine, the emergency departments were overflowing with patients due to heat-related reasons. So first I'm going to rem remind us all of that fact about our 50-50 chance of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next five years. So right now, at one degree Celsius, the rate of a heat event that typically would only happen once a decade, back in the 1850 to 1900s, so now occurs about three times more likely, and it's about 1.2 degrees Celsius hotter. At 1.5, it's nearly four times more likely, and 1.9 degrees Celsius hotter. So how can we tell stories that educate people about these harms, especially in areas where people just aren't used to it. And heat, to me, is that insidious killer, right? It's people dying quietly at home, collapsing on the sports field. It's not like the big events where a hurricane comes and everyone's attention is there. Now this, you know, the Pacific Northwest heat wave was so rare, but as they become more frequently, I mean, people may, may get lost in the headlines. But how, again, if we want to move people to action, it's not only the upstream action, but also helping people recognize the harms working with healthcare providers and public health departments to help protect people, especially those that are most vulnerable. Because it probably is of no surprise, again, these interconnected solutions, or these interconnected challenges, that areas that are previously redlined, which is a out, now outlawed discriminatory practice against blacks, have caused the environments where those neighborhoods, even today, have more concrete. And anyone who knows who stood in a parking lot or a park knows that there's a clear temperature difference. And as it's been shown here, that of this looking at cities across the US, they're exposed to greater heat. How can we tell stories there? That again, highlights the opportunity for intervention. Air quality, you guys, Know this well. And this just shows sort of the number of days. Um, this is dangerous air quality levels that have occurred. And that's the yellow spikes. Obviously, you can find whatever area of the state resonates most with you. And this, again, is no surprise to anyone who lives here. But how do we 
tell stories that ties what you guys are experiencing to climate change to make people recognize why we're acting upstream, <laughs> why an equitable transition from fossil fuels matters, and how we can implement solutions and protections. So there was, again, some good stories that I, I sort of did a little poll on different stories that were told. I think air quality is one that often can incorporate some of the health lens a bit more than others. But how can we talk, study to understand talking about air quality in a way, again, that motivates action and understanding it was, and recognizing the injustices. Again, unfortunately, probably no surprise, but indigenous and tribal communities are disproportionately exposed to wildfire smoke. And there have been some different stories that have tried to tell that story. Because in another aspect is a wildfire smoke has been shown to be ten, potentially 10 times more harmful than just air pollution from burning of fossil fuels. And we're all interconnected to this. The air quality in New York City was the worst in 15 years after the Dixie Fire in California. I saw haziness in our environment because of wildfire smoke that had traveled across the country. So telling these interconnected stories so that way people recognize where the upstream cause is. Pollen levels, there is, this is sort of that more universal entry point for people on climate change. This is anecdotal, we need to study this. But pollen levels and, and pollen seasons have been 50% longer because of climate change with higher concentrations. Maybe you guys have experienced that. Thinking about how to tell these stories around these more generalizable impacts, because everybody is impacted to some degree. From a, I don't know if there's any, again, you guys look forward to dialogue here, because I don't know if any of these things um, well, may or may not resonate depending on your perspective. But I think from a perspective of healthcare, you want a physician, a healthcare team that is fully trained. As climate change causes ticks and mosquitoes to live in different places, it's causing some tick-borne diseases to present in places that historically have not experienced them or experienced them significantly. So now, you know, every rash, unless you have a tick's head sticking in here, like you see here, which doesn't always happen, most cases of Lyme disease, there was never any recognition of a tick that had been seen. And you don't even have to be the one that goes outside. You can have a pet that goes outside, gets the tick, brings the tick inside. But every rash has to be thought about as potentially climate change, climate, well, as Lyme disease, sorry, that could be expanding because of, driven in part, by climate change. So we in the healthcare community are thinking about how to expand education and incorporate climate change into our curriculum and making sure we can give health professionals that latest data so that way they can know when diseases are on the rise within their community. So this is infrastructure that had helped to be expanded with the pandemic. So we think about surveillance and there's opportunities there to help leverage that same infrastructure for broader goals. Following Hurricane Maria, that struck Puerto Rico. The majority of saline, which is literally water in a bag, is produced in Puerto Rico. Those factories were damaged and caused a widespread shortage of saline. Impacted me in Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital. If you didn't meet certain criteria and were sick enough, essentially, then you didn't get intravenous saline, and we actually handed out Gatorade to patients. Now just imagine yourself going to an emergency department for vomiting, diarrhea, and being handed a can of Gatorade. Opportunity for education. But these are some of the stories when we think about healthcare impacts. Because 
we can have the latest technology. We have the latest cancer treatment. But if you can't actually get to a hospital that has power, that is able to administer the treatment, then it's not going to have benefits. There was a study published in the JAMA, a leading medical journal, that showed that patients who had lung cancer, when their treatments were interrupted because of a hurricane, they had higher mortality, so they died sooner. There is also most hospitals, when they have a backup power grid for their facility, when power goes out, it often does not actually work the HVAC system. So there was a hospital down the street from where I live. It was on a 90 degree Fahrenheit day. They lost power. And there, uh, it became, they didn't have the cooling system on the backup generator. So it became so warm on upper floors of the hospital that patients had to be evacuated by firefighters down to lower levels. There was also so much heat around some of the machines, like MRIs and CAT scans, the imaging technology, that they became overheated. So even when power was restored, those machines still had to cool down further and were off limits. Meaning that if you had presented during then and they wanted to get a CAT scan to look for problems, they would not have been able to access, you would have been delayed in getting that um, information. So again, these are under-recognized opportunities for integration. We also think about the paramedics who actually go into patients' homes. How can we use their experience of being in the community, interacting directly, potentially seeing ways that they can intervene, provide education to patients in their homes as another creative opportunity for what we call sort of community paramedicine. We're trying to move more healthcare into homes. We actually now have a, a system at MGH where we can do home hospital. So we can send you home with an IV and a nurse or a team can show up at your house. How can we leverage this type of care in order to provide climate adapted or climate informed care? There was a woman who showed up at my emergency department from Boston Logan Airport, came directly from the hospital, or from the airport. She had lived in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria, which was shown to be intensified because of climate change. She came, and I'll never forget it. She had this bottle, bunch of empty medication bottles in a Ziploc bag. There was still a tree branch in there. They were all empty. And she came directly there because she needed filling of her prescriptions. As we think about more displacement or migration as a result of climate-driven events, how do we actually make sure that we can have care in those new locations? Hospital charts, you might think they're all connected to a computer, but oftentimes we aren't connected to other hospitals. So how can we make sure that if you get displaced, you show up at a hospital that actually has the information you need? So all of that is to say just some of the experiences from a health standpoint that are entry points into how this actually shows up on an individual and a community level. As you think about potential opportunities, health professionals have been shown, this is an older study, we need to get new data as well, but you'll see the primary care doctor is on the far left, and this is who are the trusted voices to disseminate this information. And you'll see blue is strongly or moderately trusted, uh, and orange is strongly or moderately distrusted. So primary care doctor is more trusted compared to family and friends, CDC, climate scientists, WHO, all the way down here to US military leaders and television reporters, weather reporters. How can we all work together to tell this story, to disseminate this information in a trusted way that meets people where they are, that motivates them to action? People are not talking about climate change. It's not exactly like a fun topic. But when we can frame it as an opportunity, there is an entry point. But we also have to recognize what this means 
And so the Catherine Hayhoe, who's a climate scientist, some of you may know her, she's a colleague of mine, her big thing is just talk about it. <laughs> How do we get people to talk about it? This is the black is rarely or never. So most Americans rarely or never discuss climate change. And you can see here the Douglas County data. Only 33% discuss climate change occasionally. So how do you talk about climate change? Well, here are some best practices. This actually comes from um, Ed Maybach as far as just general advice. And again, trying to hit home, experts agree. 97% of climate scientists agree climate change is happening. It's real. It's us, human cause. It's bad, framing it around people and health. But it's solvable, it's simple, clear messages. Had the opportunity of working with the wonderful and fantastic Dr. Peters. And we, using her expertise, uh, leveraged additional tips to think about how to communicate this in a research-backed way. And as we've discussed in our advancing, we have to study this specifically for climate change. But there's a lot that we can leverage from what works. And so you can assess this uh, or get this handout that has sort of 10 tips. And there's a video you can watch as well to start to equip. Now, this community, I argue, probably knows all of these practices. I've been excited to advance this for people like me and others in other disciplines that are not thinking about this day in and day out. Also thinking about how we frame statistics. Again, mind opening for me. So do we say that 37% of heat related deaths are directly attributable to climate change or that 59% increase in heat induced deaths attributable to climate change? This is a landmark study, by the way, that established this, published in Nature Climate Change. The first is the way that it was disseminated and how it was told in the New York Times and how I had, prior to meeting Dr. Peters, continued to disseminate that information. But as is being tested, and arguably based off the, what we know, the latter is probably the better way to talk about it. So working with scientists, that way when we're disseminating information in a research publication, and then in all the other surrounding channels that you guys know very well, how can we make sure that we're framing this evidence from the start to have optimal impact and engagement? But all of that to say, remember back to the statistics about the number of people who have, who believe climate change is happening is about 64% in Douglas County. Fund research into renewable energy sources, 72%. That's higher. <laughs> Provide tax rebates for energy efficient vehicles or solar panels, 73%. Regulate CO2 as a pollutant. 65%. Schools should teach about climate change, 71%. I argue we need to mobilize, discuss, and frame the solutions. Because there's multiple benefits. We have everybody, and despite we talk about the polarization, but one thing we can all come together around, I hope, and this has been shown in data, is having health, clean air, a healthy environment, a safe future for all the little ones in our lives. So how can we just frame the solutions? Again, we can talk about and try to engage people around the words of climate change. But if I can meet with someone and we can agree on renewable energy, to me it doesn't matter if we agree on the other stuff, because we are working together towards advancing that solution. And fewer than half of Americans actually perceive that there are social norms for taking action. This is sort of data that can be dove into in a later point, but sort of the importance to family and friends, so that injective norm. And you guys probably will understand all of this in a much deeper way. But all of this is how much of an effort do your family and friends make to reduce global norming? How do we change the social norms and the understanding of working towards solutions, because people are not going to engage in climate change discussion or even the solutions. Again, if we make the argument of just bypassing that and talking about the benefits of renewable energy, 
bypassing that, coming together around the need for action, and changing social norms and social culture. All things that I argue all of you can do well. The last point here is around, again, whatever it is that people are passionate about, that people are working towards, climate change is that threat multiplier that underlies and worsens issues, touches it, which means we can find solutions to health disparities. We can also address injustices from systemic and structural racism leading to health disparities. And we can also make our climate or make our hospital systems more ready for the next pandemic or the next climate intensified health event or uh, extreme weather event. So when we think about this all hazard approach, we can tackle and prepare our systems for whatever it is that's ahead. But we have to get all those perspectives at the table, make sure we're meeting people where they are, and thinking about how to address multiple issues at once. So this is, there's a lot here, a lot of things that we need to dive into in a multi-sectoral, transdisciplinary way. But I believe that this is the pathway towards making both a grassroots effort and that case for the wider systems change of why a transition to renewable energy is an enormous opportunity to rethink and transform the way we live, the way we deliver health, the way we think about policy, whatever it is that you care about most and work on. All right, I haven't forgotten the fact that there's commitment time. So what are things that you guys can do? Well, I like to think about things as a climate lens. So whatever it is that you work on, the climate lens, that concept is just looking at it through understanding how climate change is impacting that issue now and will so in the future. If you work on health, you can add that climate lens to health. If you work on climate change, add a health lens. I also argue, and if, you know, there's probably a lot of photographers in this environment, you can have multiple lenses. So again, thinking about the interconnected solutions, how, whatever it is that you work on, how can you bring those other perspectives to the table to make sure that you're also addressing the underlying uh, health disparities or the in, from systemic and structural racism and economic injustice? the pandemic, aging, you name it. So with that lens framework, I'm going to start with the students in the room. First off, whatever it is that you, that gets you up in the morning. <laughs> that, I like that. I don't, I just like the fact that that just, yes, gets you up in the morning. And the career that you envision for yourself doesn't exist. You are the one to create it. We need to think about things in a different way, bringing people to the table in new ways. And I believe no one is better positioned than students to bring those professors from different disciplines together to think about a problem and address the solution in an action-oriented way. And then create that field. When I started this a decade ago, there wasn't a path. But I believe when you have passion and you are directed towards a goal to leverage your unique talents, that makes you unstoppable. And we need everybody to address all of the different aspects of this. So embrace it. Don't be discounted by the fact that the exact thing that you don't want it, that you dream of doesn't exist now, just means an opportunity for you to create it. So knock on doors across campus. Challenge those in power. Talk about it from the health perspective. Um, educators in the room. Again, these are, we'll come up with better solutions in conversation together. But incorporating that aspect of transdisciplinary work into your classroom, adding the health lens and that personal perspective, thinking about how to frame the reduction in air pollution as a 
opportunity and a benefit of climate action. Also, whatever it is that you work on from a research standpoint, we need a significant body of research that is leveraged towards action and solution-oriented perspectives. So add a, a, an aim that looks at how climate change affects what you already care about and work on. Completely leverage your whole infrastructure if you can, but uh, just adding even an aim is a key way with which to start to address this and generate the knowledge that we need with the speed we need. Those in practice, telling those pitching to outlets, telling the stories in different media venues, podcasts, documentaries, stories, engaging in the ways that we can embed this into the way that we think about climate change and the opportunities to transform the narrative. Leaders, it is important from an institutional standpoint to think about the obligation of, and we already, I know you, you guys are ahead of the curve here on a lot of this, thinking about trans, ways to foster that transdisciplinary engagement, seed grants, engaging people across departments. Sustainability, I recognize that can be a hard aspect to tackle, but if we model as educational facilities of acknowledging that pulling and harnessing energy from fossil fuels will create air pollution and harm to the very students and faculty and community in which you're situated. So embracing that narrative that there is an improvement for health for you, those that you are serving through that equitable transition and advancing that connection in a fundamental way can be enormously powerful. The health community is starting to do that, to break that vicious cycle, and we need to continue to expand that across corporations, across the business sector, and other aspects. And of course, policy. That same policy which has led to harms can be used and leveraged for good. And so as we think about where, how policy is going to drive where electric vehicle charging stations are placed, how can we as a health community make sure that we can produce the data? Because where an electric vehicle charging station is, especially when connected to fossil fuel generated air, um, energy, can actually worsen air quality in the communities in which it's situated. So how can we make sure that when we're charging in that electric, or placing where electric vehicle charging stations will be placed, that it will target those areas that are disproportionately bearing the brunt, but also connected to renewable energy to be able to have that interconnected benefit of not only reducing the air pollution from cars on the road, but also the energy that is fueling those cars, you know, quote, fueling those cars now. So making sure that those health and equity benefits are maximized in policy, having that perspective and data at the table. And if the data doesn't exist, then bringing the teams together and ensuring that that um, that data is being driven. And of course, public, that's all of us in the room, citizens. I view climate change as that existential threat that can bring us all together. So a lot that pulls us apart, but there's even more, I argue, that we have in common and that brings us together. Social cohesion, rebuilding community, sort of like third spaces where people used to, before the pandemic, meet at churches or places um, within other community sites. How can we engage, re-engage in those spaces oriented towards addressing these interconnected challenges? Nothing combats climate anxiety like climate action. And how can we hold our leaders accountable? We need the systems level change. And so we have to start to Demand that. Engage with your policymakers. Talk about how climate change impacts your health. Ask your healthcare provider about how you can work with them to implement protections for your health. It can start one at a time, but all we need is sort of one to then start that cascade. So we all have a role to play. As always, better solutions can be tailored depending on what your individual area of focus is. 
happy to engage, connect you with colleagues, so we can start thinking about what these different solutions are that we can implement in order to achieve that future that we all envisioned. So going back to this original question, think about what it was that you envisioned. And maybe it was a hazy vision. But I hope that the health benefits, the importance of engaging in that health narrative, or maybe more incorporated in that vision that you have. And we all have different aspects that we're coming at, and that is the strength in collective action, that we're all bringing unique perspectives, expertise, and insights. And together, we can achieve large-scale change and transform and innovate. So as a reminder, here are the three key points that we walk through. I hope you see that there is an opportunity, that climate action is an opportunity to improve health and equity, that the health narrative can make climate change personal. We need to make sure that we're talking about it in a way that motivates people to action, and that you've found at least one way that you can leverage your unique perspective to help address that. And if nothing else, just talk about it. I always like this quote, but I think in the, in my emergency department practice, when people ask what brings me the most hope, both about climate change, but also I guess about hard shifts in the emergency department, it is when that there's a sick patient that comes in a room and everyone steps into that room, whether they're a medical student or a pharmacist or the radiology tech or the nurse in order to improve the health of that patient in front of them. They leave any differences they have beside the door and they're focused on that common mission. And I'm seeing that same thing happen for climate change. And so, in this proverbial room, I look forward to all of us stepping into that together today and in the future as we create the future that we envision. Thank you. See if I can get this on. I will step over this way. Um, thank you for that. That was tremendous. Um, I suspect there may be some questions in the audience. Um, I wanted to start off by saying, though, I loved how you combined and wove together um, data and evidence with stories, and stories that's, that speak to people, that even come from your own experience in the emergency room. I, I love that combination. Do we have any questions or comments or, yes? Yeah, I should have said, McKenna's going to walk around the room. Thanks, thank you. Okay. Um, my question is also actually a little bit upset. First, I have to, I mean, thank you for your presentation and they present your perspective. But also I have a, why is that I'm upset? Because uh, several presenters, I think maybe a month ago, um, seem to also have the focus, okay, on the, say, I, I, I would say a little bit narrowly de defined the issue currently uh, we are facing. Uh, why raise the question pollution, for example? Uh, seem to be, everybody talk about climate change, but it seem to be overlooked how the climate is part of an ecosystem, okay? The whole ecosystem actually is in chaos. And the chaos not just made by, so corporate, corporation, big business or government, but also by the individual persons. For example, say Greater Thunberg, okay? She advocates for those, those uh, uh, say let big company be responsible. She is she's famous. Question is, uh, when I see a picture in Stockholm, in, uh, in the park, I see those uh, beer bottles, I see this uh, uh, face mask, I see those uh, paper, I see dog feces, and uh, nobody take, take care of that, okay? Greater Thunberg, 
never advocate, say, just let's pick up a bottle from the, from the park. Let's everybody be responsible, okay? She didn't recognize that, but she, I mean, I, I'm not to blame her, but I'm saying that uh, how the, the whole uh, society seemed to be only focused on one aspect, but uh, not say, let's say Eugene, okay, the Willamette uh, River, say by the river, if you do the exercise, you something you see the, I mean, the people threw everything in there. Some, many people walk by every day. They never pick up the, I mean, something they thought that is not their responsibility. But how could make uh, people pay attention to see that uh, everybody is part of an ecosystem? When you polluted something, even small thing in the river, you actually create not just the climate change, but also create this uh, disruption of an ecosystem. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Um, and I, yeah, I, <laughs> probably something you didn't expect me to say today. So I view climate change as a gateway drug. <laughs> Again, probably not something you expected. But it's from the standpoint of climate change is, unfortunately, in its accelerated form, something that people can begin to understand, slapping them across the face. And when they begin to realize that decisions that are made at a systems level, policy, um, corporation decisions, that all of that impacts the environment, and the environment is impacting them increasingly, then that also starts to allow them to see how other things and other decisions we make in the environment are also impacting them. Plastics, fossil fuels creates plastics. Microplastics, there's a whole literature around toxicology of plastics. I think my experience is that when, especially engaging the health community, where people have understood, or, and increasingly, the importance of an equitable transition away from fossil fuels. When I start to talk about forests, the importance of forest health, and our relationships with biodiversity with the environment, when I think about pandemics, and the fact we are getting into increasing encounters with wildlife that increase risk of transmission from animals to humans for the next pandemic. I think that can be, it's hard to wrap their mind around how to tackle that, but I think my hope is that as we build these mental frameworks and begin to envision that we can create a different future and a different recognition of what contributes to health, that that can allow them to begin to see how small things like polluting the river have downstream impacts. So I sort of view this as, again, I'll say it again, you know, sort of that gateway <laughs> into the, these bigger recognition. And I hope that we can envision a future where all of those perspectives are incorporated to your, to your wise comments. Thank you. Yeah, I like that systemic approach and but we need to figure out how to get there, how to get from where we are today to being able to envision that kind of bigger system. Um, but I appreciated the comments. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, thanks so much for that talk. So I'm a behavioral health researcher and I'm interested in um, co-benefit prescribing among healthcare practitioners, health behavior specialists, where um, when they're working especially with prevention of non-communicable disease and they might be you know, giving a prescription for increased exercise or um, you know, uh, dietary pattern changes, that they would also take into account ecological and, and social benefit into how and what they prescribe. Um, and it seems clear, at least to me, theoretically, you know, that that makes sense, but I have a harder time thinking about it in terms of a protocol or, you know, what this would look like in practice because there isn't, in this direction, there isn't as much specificity as go do, you know, get an air filtration because, you know, for asthma and CVD, as you mentioned, um, it's more like, okay, instead of just recommending exercise, maybe I say, when you're running by the river, also pick up, you know, the, the plastics or gardening, you know, but it, it becomes a little bit more broad, and I know there have been efforts to identify 
um, co-benefit prescribing actions that have evidence base behind them. But I'm curious if you've seen research specifically on implementing this within a healthcare facility and if you, you know, can talk about what you think that would look like. Thank you. Well, thank you for your work and your question. So there is data that shows, again, thinking about those interconnected solutions, that if people are walking or biking more frequently, which is leaving behind potentially gas-powered cars, um, that that can also improve their physical activity, especially in this era of working from home or sitting behind Zoom. Thinking about different dietary choices, uh, largely thinking about more plant-based diets that, that can eliminate some of the, um, or eliminate or minimize the greenhouse gas emissions associated with raising of animals. So just for sort of general level setting and some of the you know, co-benefits that have been examined. So I think those are kind of the two big buckets that have been looked at, also thinking about um, Again, air pollution benefits is another that uh, has been studied more so. So there is some of this data. We need more of it, and we need it that is actually structured towards action and interventions. There's still a disconnect between the theoretical, here are the um, theoretical benefits, and what does that actually mean for the patient in front of you. There is also a lack of clear guidelines for different practitioners or specialties within medicine on what climate-informed care means, adding a climate lens in that photography perspective to what it is that they do every day. So that is something that we are working to further. And I think as we go through this process across systematically and comprehensively across specialties, I mean, one that actually meets clinicians where they are, shows them why it matters to their day-to-day, -day, but also uh, will produce a, a an action-oriented research agenda of acknowledging that there's a lot that we don't know. Also, from a prescribing and sort of that engagement at the patient level, there's an enormous opportunity to understand what are the best ways with which to talk about these different interventions, co-benefits, as we as again has been termed, with different actions that can be taken at an individual level. So I am not aware of anything that's really studied that at an individual level to understand what's worked, how many actually take action after in counseling session, you know, X, Y, Z. But I agree that those are, this is where we need to move, especially as we think about ways, because there are health professionals, whatever your health-related um, perspective is, we are embedded across the entire United States in every community in some way. And so that's an enormous opportunity to leverage those one-on-one -on -one interactions that may meet people where they are, just as we always do in health. We did it at the pandemic. Whether you took the vaccine or not, we will have the conversation and we'll engage in, the conver and engage in whatever it is to meet you in your individual health goals. But there's an opportunity there to, to capture that. Thank you. I wonder if I could take a moment to ask my own question. Because I've been curious about this. Yeah. So you talk a lot. I know you're a big proponent of physicians um, talking to others about climate change and the effects of climate change, including patients. Mm -hmm. How do you, as an emergency room physician, um, how do you talk with patients? Does it make a difference if they're more liberal, more conservative, more accepting of the notion of climate change, less accepting of that? What, how do you think through that about how to communicate? Yeah. And the pre-existing beliefs or background may be that informs that conversation. I don't generally have that luxury when I meet a patient, arguably and sometimes the worst day, moment of their life. We though also are increasing as a safety net for the healthcare system. We increasingly do provide services that could be deemed sort of more um, similar to outpatient care. So refilling medications or talking about high blood pressure and other aspects. So we, again, have to meet whoever that patient is. We meet them where they are with the situation they have. And so I know their history from a health standpoint, obviously. 
And so I think about my mission with that pa in that patient relationship and that obligation with the oath that I took, and that is to improve their health. But that allows me a unique perspective, being able to connect climate-related conversations and meeting them in whatever way that climate change is impacting their health. So the way I approach it is to think about what are the interventions that would improve their health. And I'm meeting them sometimes in, in the middle of a heat wave. Oftentimes for other things, we say, go follow up with your primary care doctor for those additional medication changes or other things. But most people are not gonna see their primary care doctor until after the heat wave has already passed, until the air quality has already hit a peak and come down from the wildfire smoke. And so I talk about ways in which they can uh, in, protect their health from whatever exposure is relevant to their medical conditions. And sometimes that conversation does lead to, oh, is this related to climate change? Is this, and some, I've even had conversations where people have talked about you know, burning of fossil fuels. Sometimes we do go all the way upstream. So do, do you bring it up or do you wait for them to bring it up? So I, I personally, in my environment, I don't because my, my goal is to make yeah. that connection with how to improve their health from the threat that yeah. is harming them and hope that that plants a seed so then when they you know, see that connection, and sometimes I'll say things like, oh, it's becoming more common. And if, you, know, you sort of read the room, as always, and so sometimes you know, we may engage in that or things that they say. But I don't necessarily feel in that moment in a high pressure, time sensitive environment in the emergency department for me to necessarily walk all the way upstream. Because again, from my standpoint, if we can agree on the solution that we all want clean air, healthier air, a stable climate, then that is enough yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you also talked to Congress. <laughs> Other questions, comments, solutions that people see? Yeah, Torsten. It'll be just a sec. Uh, thanks you for your presentation. One of the, the question I have is, you're talking about the percentages of people who felt a sense of urgency about the, the challenges of climate change. And I, I think I, I, I want to ask you about some cultural differences that get in the way of that. And I don't mean cultural as an ethnicity. I mean between yeah. medicine academia, and communications. And uh, I worked 30 years in media, in newspapers mostly, and now I make films. And there is a lot that's happening in the field of medicine that people should know about. Mm -hmm. And the way people understand them is anecdotally. And you can throw all kinds of pie charts and numbers at them, but until they feel it personally, as you said, they're not going to, and good storytellers do that. Hospitals have armies of PR people whose job it is to stay on corporate message mm -hmm. that you have to get past to get that. And there's, there's both very good and then some not some very good reasons why what happens in the healthcare world is, is invisible. Mm -hmm. And making it visible, I think, can, and it happens, mm -hmm. it's just extremely hard. It's, it's easier to get in a prison in the United States than a hospital, for a journalist, for example. Um, and then we have the world, it, the other is the pace of information and the way information is. Uh, academics in general, and scientists in particular, tend to lead with caveats. So you ask about wildfires and uh, climate change, and the first thing here is a list of 18 reasons that they might not be connected, even though mm -hmm. they are mostly. Whereas those of us who speak to a general audience, if we do that, all those people go away, right? We, anecdotes work because they, are, they represent bigger truths. Um, and the same kind of cultural difference happens in research as it happens. Research works at a very different pace than the communications industry. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what I'm asking is, how do we build more trust and a sense of common mission mm -hmm. among us so that, that mm -hmm. they, there's an unnecessary antagonism often? And I think there'll always be some kind of tension, which could be kind of created and inter 
it, does it make sense what I'm asking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. There's a concept in science called transdisciplinary science. So how can we take a lot of different, the unique perspectives and expertise of a lot of different disciplines and combine them together to create new research? It's convergent science. There's a lot of really fun terms around that. But it's really hard because people don't speak the same language. They come with different definitions, different understandings. We're siloed. I, if I had to put one thing up on an office wall, if I like embody something, it's probably be a sledgehammer because I, I love to go around and try to break down those walls. Because reality is, as you said, we're all we're joined together in a common mission, but we're all and there's that sense of urgency, and so everyone wants to act, but there's unharnessed power as people try to do something, uh, and so it's. I believe in the fundamental vision that we can create co true collective action, that we can bring people together across society with health and equity as what I hope to be common priorities, that hopefully, independent of whatever people walk in the room with, that they can join together in understanding that that should be a motivation to act on climate change and that those benefits also should be maximized. So we're, we, I'm going to say we, <laughs> are thinking about how to do that. And that involves getting people to, to have a common definition for certain things, to speak common languages, um, to work together in new ways. And how do we also embed frontline communities and fence line communities, those that are most impacted, to bring their expertise and lived experience and come alongside them so that way they can help, well, I would say, or in many cases, drive where the needs are and what the solutions are. So we're thinking about that. Let's have more conversations as we continue to try to embody and, and operationalize that. I think it's something else really struck me in the sense of the healthcare facilities is sort of that PR um, machine. We're at a really unique moment in healthcare where the pandemic has uh, pulled at all of the seams, and we are seeing frame <laughs> that is visible externally, whether that is burnout in the healthcare workers, that is shortages that we've had in. Um, in emergency departments or other hospitals that we can't get the workers that are needed to care for the patients, that there's record crowding. That, uh, and I think that there is a need for humility in the healthcare industry especially, that there is a problem. We have to, the true fixes require innovation and thinking about doing things in a transformationally different way, which I think also has to be um, some transparency around where problems are and recognizing that we do not have the solutions, but I think we, the collective we, do have the solutions. And I'm hopeful that, that uh, those conversations can unfold at this unique moment of, of arguably crisis within healthcare. I think our time might be up. Uh, I wonder if everyone would join me in thanking Dr. Salas first. Thank you so much. It was absolutely wonderful to have you visit. I know we have a tiny bit more of your time after this, um, and I'm hoping some of you might join us for a little bit of that time. We'll have a reception just following this over in Allen Hall in the atrium. Uh, it's just kind of right, I don't know which direction I'm pointing. Um, follow the, that way. I hear it's that way. <laughs> Um, but join us over in Allen Hall in the atrium. Uh, a little bit of food, a little bit of beverage, um, and a little bit more of uh, Dr. Salas's um, intellect and, and lovely temperament. And I hope you join us. Thank you very much. <laughs>